Susan Hills, the woman in black, tells the story of Arthur Kipps, a gently ambitious junior solicitor who leaves London to attend the funeral of Mrs. Alice Drablow in an isolated northern, windswept, marshy outpost. Whilst at the funeral, Arthur spots a gaunt, extremely pale woman in black. Someone it rapidly transpires is actually the malevolent, manically disturbed ghost of Janet Humphrey. Whilst attempting to sort through a mountain of tedious paperwork at Mrs. Drablow's former abode, Eel Marsh House, Arthur sees the ghost once again. His youthful London arrogance quickly deteriorates when faced with this and other supernatural experiences he cannot account for, and the subsequent effect on his mental equilibrium is monumental. The Woman in Black uses Arthur's first-person narrative throughout. It is through his eyes that the story of The Woman in Black is slowly unveiled. As a result, the impression we get of this narrator is crucial to the success of the story as a whole. The vast majority of modern readers do not believe in the supernatural, yet we are all willing to suspend these disbeliefs and enjoy a good ghost story, provided that the majority of the story rings true that we can identify with setting and characters, that tension is built up to make the impossible seem possible, at least within our imagination. So what impression do we get of Hill's narrator and how believable is his narrative? And how does this narrative build up tension before the first sighting of the woman in black? Well, stay tuned. For the producers of Schofield on Shakespeare, this is your essential last minute GCSE English Literature revision guide to Susan's Hill, The Woman in Black. We first meet our convivial narrator at home with his family on Christmas Eve. Our early impression of the narrator is that he is a devoted, decent family man. Following a turn outside in the frosty darkness, Arthur describes his reaction to returning indoors. And indeed, I did give thanks at the sight of my family ensconced around the huge fire. Just seeing his family together gives Arthur pleasure. And unlike your stereotypical, grumpy, inflexible old man, he aims to maintain a positive, you-friendly attitude to life. Whilst his stepchildren are telling highly elaborate, melodramatic, traditional ghost stories, his aim is to get into the spirit of things. I did not want to seem a killjoy, old and stodgy and unimaginative. I longed to enter into what was nothing more nor less than good fun. These words suggest that Arthur is in principle a good sport, someone keen to participate and contribute within his family environment. Additionally, he has the emotional intelligence to take a step back and identify how he is likely to be perceived by others. Following this self-analysis, his inclination is clearly to modify his feelings and behavior where possible in order to be more agreeable to the family he clearly worships. The fact that Arthur is unable to first enjoy the ghost stories and then tell his own is therefore significant and cannot be explained away with reference to supposed grumpy old man syndrome or character defects. As well as being a devoted family man, Arthur is a man of simple pleasures who appreciates nature. At the beginning of his narrative, he reveals candidly, I have always liked to take a breath of the evening to smell the air, whether it is sweetly scented and balmy with the flowers of midsummer, pungent with, with, the, with the bonfires and leaf mould of autumn, or crackling cold from frost and snow. Arthur's words are full of poetic, descriptive detail. The alliterative, sweetly scented and crackling cold create pleasingly harmonious sounds befitting references to nature. And the fact that he can pinpoint what he likes so precisely the smell of the leaf mould of autumn is a good example, implies that his narrative as a whole may be equally precise and therefore more to be relied upon, even when it comes to the descriptions of the strange and the supernatural. Arthur's appreciation of nature is seen throughout his narrative. 
Following Mrs. Drablow's funeral, he sees a blackbird open his mouth to pour out a sparkling fountain of song in the November sunlight. The metaphor, sparkling fountain of song, is gloriously positive and conjures up images of music spurting up vibrantly into the air and further reinforces our impression of a man who notices and seeks to capture in words the small details of nature. Even after the mental meltdown caused by his experiences in and around Eel Marsh House, Arthur retains the appealing simplicity to reflect that before coming here, I would never have been able to concentrate on such an ordinary thing so completely, but I would be restless to be up and off doing this or that busily. Now, I appreciate I appreciated the bird's presence. Another feature of Arthur's character that comes across through his narrative is his consideration, his thoughtfulness about others. During the first chapter, he decides that it would be wrong to narrate his ghost story in person to his family. And he writes, I decided at once that it should be, at least during my lifetime, a story for my eyes only. I was the one who had been haunted and who had suffered. It was from me alone that the ghost must be driven. These words show a steely determination not to inflict pain and suffering on others and to bear the heavy burden of his horrific memories on his own, in spite of the possible relief that could be provided by confiding in a loved one. This insistence on independence is both laudable, but also makes the reader even more intrigued about what may have happened to this resolute, dignified man in the past. It must be something significant if not a single detail can be revealed until his death. In fact, Arthur is so considerate that he will lie to protect others. Faced with quizzical looks and metaphorical raised eyebrows, following his refusal to participate in the Christmas Eve ghost story telling fun, he had to invent a bad bout of acute indigestion to account for my abrupt behaviour. Our impression of our narrator so far is that he is a decent sort. The fact he resorts so readily to deception to those he loves once again builds up tension about what he may have experienced in the past. In the chapter entitled Spider, Arthur has dinner with Samuel Daly and his balanced description of this man reinforced the idea that this narrator and narrative can be relied upon. Daly is clearly an extremely wealthy individual as witnessed by his habitation of an imposing, rather austere country park, which reminded me of something that a character in the novels of Jane Austen might have inhabited. Nonetheless, Arthur, a man who, remember, is putting off his own marriage until he is, a, he is in a financially more secure position, is not remotely jealous and gives these measured words. But he could surely not be disliked. He was so simple, so direct, so unashamed of his ambitions. So Arthur is clearly a man not to make judgments based on emotion. This draws the respect of the reader and makes us far more inclined to be lured in on the occasions that he is seized by the emotion of fear for he is normally so rational. His appreciation of Daly is fair and balanced and shows an appreciation of his host's good qualities. Arthur likes the fact that he openly desires wealth and advancement, with the implication that it is covert, backstabbing ascensions that should be frowned upon. And as a result, we like Arthur for being so decent towards the man who is, after all, providing him with an excellent dinner. We also like Arthur for his candor. This is shown not just in his minute, honest, analytical descriptions of his fear, which you normally expect an older man to be so open with his feelings, but also when describing his own religious belief in the penultimate chapter, A Packet of Letters. He explains that he had been brought up as a Christian child, but although I still believe that his teachings were probably the best form of guidance on living a good life, I found the deity rather remote and my prayers were not anything but formal and dutiful, not so now. Many readers would be able to associate with this lack of spiritual fervour. This detachment and lack of day-to-day -day identification with an almighty God. Arthur's honesty about his own religious experience is appealing and continues the impression we have of him as a character we can relate to and a character we can trust. Yet although he is a devoted family man, prone to balanced analysis, appreciative of nature and considerate to others, he has his imperfections like any one of us. On the long train journey to Criff and Gifford, there is a hint of self-pride and pomposity when he reveals his profession to Samuel Daly. I am her solicitor, he tells his travelling companion, before revealing in the subsequent sentence, I was rather pleased with the way it sounded. 
The simple sentence revelation, I am her solicitor, is both a straightforward statement of facts and an opportunity to affirm his middle class pride in his professional identity and respectability. Nonetheless, beneath this middle class pride in his occupation lies a clear intelligence. In the chapter entitled Mr. Jerome is Afraid, Arthur has returned to the village following some terrifying experiences at Eel Marsh House. He writes, for a long time, I looked and looked and recognised what was happening to me. My emotions had now become so volatile and so extreme. My nervous response is so near the surface, so rapid and keen that my heart seemed to beat faster, my step to be quicker, and all this since yesterday. The repetition of looks and the prepositional phrase show how Arthur knows he needs to take the time to understand how he has been affected by his experiences. It shows that he possesses the intelligent ability to self-analyse and reflect, making the consequent description of increased heartbeat and panic-stricken walking speed all the more worrying. This man has the calm intelligence to describe accurately what is happening to him, which in turn makes the existence of the supernatural threat within the story all the more believable. One of the most striking features of Arthur's narrative is his humanity. Whilst at Mrs. Drablow's funeral, he comments on the lack of mourners. I shivered as I thought once again how inexpressibly sad it was that the ending of a whole human life, from birth and childhood, through adult maturity to extreme old age, should here be marked by no blood relative or heart's friend. And so, not only is Arthur decent enough at the beginning of the book, which of course is chronologically later than this point, not to burden his family with his own spine-chilling past, but he can empathise with a dead stranger when away on potentially career-building business. His physiological reaction of shivering is instinctively empathetic, whilst the personification of Hart in Hart's Friend shows a touching awareness of the life-affirming benefits of friendship. Alone far from home, he sees the, or at this stage, a woman in black at the funeral and, worrying about her unhealthy appearance, vowed to speak to her and see if I could be of any assistance after the funeral was over. Way after the funeral, and even after all his haunting ex experiences at Eel Marsh House, our narrator is able to appreciate the woman in black's point of view. She had been a poor, crazed, troubled woman, dead of grief and distress filled with hatred and desire for revenge. Her bitterness was understandable. The wickedness that led her to take away other women's children because she had lost her own, understandable too, but not forgivable. The adjectives poor, crazed and troubled reveal an emotive attempt to grasp some of the tragic realities of Janet Humphrey's life, whilst the repetition of understandable in relation to her evil bitterness is remarkable as by this stage the re-reader will know that this same ghost killed her own fiancé and only child. The creation of a humane, rational, believable, supernatural sceptic nature is one device Hill uses in her creation of a successful ghost story. But this is just one device, for the narrative itself is meticulously structured to build up tension well before the first appearance of the woman in black. I previously referred to the way the novel is structured. The fact that the first chapter is set in the near present, whereas the rest of the novel, the dramatic final sentence aside, is set decades previously. Hill introduces the topic of traditional ghost stories in the first chapter, which contrasts sharply with the reality that is to be narrated in subsequent chapters. The narrator's stepchildren, told of dripping stone walls in uninhabited castles and of ivy-clad monastery ruins by moonlight, of locked inner rooms and secret dungeons, dank charnel houses and overgrown gra graveyards, of footsteps creaking upon staircases, and it continues for a whopping 56 words. Hill's use of conjuries floods the reader with stereotypical, cliché images relating to the horror genre. There are just so many spooky noun phrases, and the fact they are listed so casually and relentlessly implies that they are products of a horror movie-inspired imagination rather than reality. And so the sceptical tone and the sense of contrast are set. Such over-the-top melodramatic horror stories involving hooded monks and headless horsemen, women turned white-haired and raving lunatic, are ludicrous, albeit quite good fun. 
the story that has to be narrated will be quite different. Indeed, throughout this first chapter, there are repeated hints of past horrors and the long-term debilitating effects they have had on the narrator. There is an intriguing reference made to the narrator coming out from under the long shadow cast by the events of the past. And a retired boss who inexplicably had always blamed himself, at least in part, for what had happened to me. Hill deliberately does not elabor elaborate. We are not told at this stage what had happened to the narrator to ne necessitate Mr Bentley having to blame himself. And we are not given any details about the long shadow which clearly plunged the narrator's life metaphorically into the abyss over a sustained period of time. As his stepchildren tell their wholly unrealistic but great fun to narrate ghost stories, the narrator describes his increasing feelings of terrible unease but not why he feels so uneasy. I was trying to suppress my mounting unease to hold back the rising flood of memory. These words reveal an impotent desire to retain control over past memories, whilst the metaphor flood of memory implies that deep within his soul he holds a huge quantity of thoughts and feelings about past events that could potentially overwhelm and inflict damage. After leaving the room, and house to recover his senses, he describes his heart pounding, my breathing short, and having walked about in a frenzy of agitation. It is worth looking more closely at the definition of a frenzy. Cambridge Dictionaries Online describe it as uncontrolled and excited behaviour, or emotion that is sometimes violent. And yet what has happened to the narrator beyond hearing some ludicrously melodramatic stories of the supernatural whilst relaxing by the warm glow of a fire accompanied by his nearest and dearest? This first chapter gives repeated hints that something terrible has happened to the narrator and tension is steadily built up by merely describing the effect these terrible events have had rather than what these events actually were. As well as contrasting feeble, cliché ghost stories with hints of a terrifying past reality, Hill repeatedly uses pathetic fallacy to create a sense of foreboding. On the morning Arthur is told he needs to attend to the affairs of the recently deceased Mrs Drablow, London is covered with a dismal fog. It was a yellow fog, a filthy, evil-smelling fog, a fog that choked and blinded, smeared and stained. The adjectives yellow, and filthy and evil smelling are portentous, whilst the personification of the fog choking and blinding implies that it is a malignant force. Even after Arthur has escaped the fog of London, on the train to the north, there are bursts of rain like sprays of light artillery fire upon the windows. The, the simile makes the rain seem as malevolent as the fog. It is as though Arthur's train, and by implication himself, is being physically attacked as he heads to his ruinous destination. Even away from the rain, he is trapped in the cold tomb of a railway carriage. Just as the fog seeks to strangle, the, the rain pumps bullets, so his apparent haven, his quiet, peaceful railway carriage, is figuratively associated with dead bodies and decay. This ghoulish imagery continues as Arthur heads to Mrs Drablow's funeral the following day. In contrast to those attending the farmer's auction, I felt like a spectre at some cheerful feast, and that our appearance among the men in workaday or country clothes was that of a pair of gloomy ravens. It is fitting that Arthur feels like a spectre, a ghost, that he is shortly to witness one. Foreshadowing is also seen in the ominous reference to ravens, traditionally associated with death. So even before Arthur sees the women in black at Mr Drablow's funeral, even before he arrives at Eel Marsh House, Hill's use of pathetic fallacy and foreshadowing creates a menacing atmosphere in which evil could flourish. Tension is also built up with the reticence of locals to talk about Eel Marsh House. On the train, Samuel Daly's body language seems more significant than his words when asked to whether he plans to tell strange tales of Mrs. Drablow's abode. He gave me a straight look. No, he said at last, I am not. Arthur goes on to explain that he shuddered all the more because of the openness of his gaze and the directness of his manner. The hesitance, the brevity of the reply, the unexplained straight look clearly give the impression that there is more to Eelmar's house than just its remote, remote location. 
Indeed, the effects of such an apparently insignificant response. And look, it's to make Arthur shudder, instinctively tremble for reasons he cannot explain at this juncture. When the, past, when the pair disembarked the train, Mr. Daly gave me a straight, steady stare and said nothing. These silent, searching looks emit an unexpected air of solemnity. Why such apparent restraint? Why such gravity? Just because a solicitor is attending a funeral and planning to visit the deceased house afterwards. The landlord at the Gifford Arms is similarly taciturn in relation to both Mrs. Drablow and Eelmarsh House. Following a casual question from Arthur as to whether he has heard of the former, the landlord's face flickered with, what? Alarm, was it? Suspicion? I could not tell, but the name had stirred some strong emotion in him, all signs of which he endeavoured to suppress at once. As ever, it is the instinctive reaction to name and location that is more significant than actual words spoken. Each time Mrs. Drablo and Neil Marsh House are mentioned, locals cannot prevent themselves from unwittingly revealing deeply held feelings and emotions through their body language. Samuel Daly stares intensely. Long repressed emotions appear momentarily on the landlord's face. And still, like the young, naive Arthur Kipps, we do not know why these men cannot help themselves from reacting in this way, which continues the slow, simmering build-up of tension. When the landlord does give his response, it is how he speaks which shows his clear and seemingly irrational discomfort with the subject of Mrs. Drablow and Eelmarsh House. He tells Arthur, I knew of her, he said evenly, and after a further brief comment, turned away abruptly. The adverbs evenly and abruptly show first a desire for his speech not to reveal any disconcerting shifts in tone and pitch, and then his wish to get away from both Arthur and the topic he has just raised as quickly as possible. In the same chapter, Arthur meets, meets Mr. Jerome, a local property agent, and the same unexplained reticence and instinctively uncomfortable body language persists, following what would normally be a straightforward question about whether Mrs. Drablo had a family grave, he replies, no, at least not here, not in this churchyard. When pressed, he continues haltingly, it is no longer in use, the area is unsuitable. Jerome uses a false start by first denying that there is a family grave, but then hesitatingly admitting that one exists. The repeated pauses indicated by the two ellipses further suggest that he is choosing his words incredibly carefully with the implicit assumption that he is hiding something. Just like Samuel Daly and the landlord, he will not elaborate under any circumstances or explain why he is hesitating and reformulating responses that should in theory be straightforward to give. Tension continues to build up and just a few sides later the narrator describes the very first sighting of the woman in black. This essay has explored two key areas of Susan Hill's The Woman in Black. We began by exploring the narrator and concluded that he comes across as a kind, decent, family man who could empathise with others and could be trusted to deliver a reliable narrative. We continued by exploring how Hill builds up tension, looking closely at the repeated hints given by the narrator of past horrors, the use of pathetic fallacy and the strange reticence of locals to even talk about Eel Marsh House, let alone go anywhere near there. This has been a Schofield on Shakespeare production, helping you revise for your GCSE English Literature exam on Susan Hill's The Woman in Black. Thanks for watching.